And it introduces us to a man named Boaz. And it gives us a suggestion here that, that Boaz might be something very important later on in the story. I got to tell you, it's one of the things I love about the scriptures. There are so many times as we come back to the scriptures where we see irony, we see foreshadowing, we see God giving us something and just kind of, kind of giving you a little teaser of what's going to come later. And here's one of those places where it, it speaks to us of this guy named Boaz. There's no other reason to provide the fact that they had a relative named Boaz at this point. The name of Boaz means a son of strength, lively, vigorous. It tells us that he was a man of standing in the community. But what does that mean? That means that number one, he was a man of wealth. Uh, this is a man who, who was prosperous. But it means much more than that he was just materially <coughs> prosperous. And it tells us that, that he had, he was a man of high character. And he was a man that the people in the community looked up to. He was highly respected. This guy Boaz is the one that, that when he walks down the street, the people look and go, hey, that's Boaz. If you got a problem and you need some help, if you have a question that, that you can't figure out an answer to, Boaz is the kind of guy you want to go talk to. And so people would look up to Boaz. He, he was a man that, that, that just demanded respect without ever demanding anything. It was the kind of guy that you just looked at and said, you can trust him. He was a good man. And Naomi and Ruth are totally unaware of how God is going to work to redeem them, to save them, to take care of them. You know, Ruth and Naomi are wondering, how are we going to make it in life? How are we going to get through God has already given them an answer, and they haven't even seen it yet. The citizens of Philkirk, Austria, didn't know what to do. Napoleon's massive army was preparing to attack. The soldiers had been spotted on the hill on the heights above the little town, which was situated on the Austrian border. A council of citizens was hastily summoned to decide whether they should try to defend themselves or display the white flag of surrender. It just happened to be Easter Sunday. And the people had gathered in the local church. The pastor rose and said, Friends, we have been counting on our own strength, and apparently that has failed. As this is the day of our Lord's resurrection, let us just ring the bells, have our services as usual, and leave the matter in his hands. We know only our weakness, and not the power of God to defend us. The council accepted his plan, and the church bells rang. Interestingly, Napoleon's army, hearing the sudden pealing of the bells, concluded that the Austrian army had arrived during the night to defend the town. And before the service ended, Napoleon's army broke camp and retreated. We never know just how and when God will provide. Think for a minute. How has God provided in your life? Ruth and Naomi have no idea how God is going to provide. They just know that they need to be able to secure food to eat. And so Naomi or Ruth is going to go out and glean that she has no idea. She doesn't know anyone. She's just going to walk out to a field and, and start gathering what's left in a field. She has no idea how God is going to provide and protect for her. But we already know. Because God has already told us in verse 1 of Boaz. The folks, in your life, it's often like that. We often don't know how God is going to take care of us. And sometimes we don't know how God is going to work out whatever situation it is that we're facing. But God does know it. Here, he's already said he's got Boaz waiting in the wings. In verses 2 and 3, we see Ruth taking the initiative. These verses are a picture of being diligent in seeking to meet one's needs. In face of major problems, Ruth didn't give up. You know, she could have just given up and said, 
Let's just go back to Moab. At least I've got family there. I know nobody here. Nobody is going to help us. How are we going to survive? A Ruth is a, is a foreign woman in a land where she has no protection. She has no protectors. And she, is, she is susceptible to all kinds of harassment. And, and trust me, the Jewish people, they didn't like anybody that was not Jewish. Let me just kind of say it that way. You know, there, there were particular groups that they really didn't like, but they just kind of didn't like anybody that was not a Jewish person themselves. And here is Naomi, a foreigner, really from one of the, the people groups that, that Israel really didn't like. And here she is in the middle of Israel trying to wonder how she's going to survive. And so she goes out. Instead of sitting at home, and expecting somebody else to take care of her, Ruth gets up in the morning and goes out to the fields. If you have a Bible, turn over to Leviticus chapter 19. We read Leviticus 19 verses 9 and 10. God is laying out laws and commands to his people and he says, When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. Now I want to make a quick point here. This is Israel's welfare system. It really is. This law in Leviticus 19, it is Israel's welfare system. But do you notice a difference in Israel's welfare system and our welfare system? In Israel's welfare system, those who were getting help actually had to get up, go, and work. God is making sure that the farmers are leaving some things. He says to them, don't go to the very edge of your field. He's saying, leave a little corner. Leave the corners. Don't get all of it. And then he says, as you're going through, if, you, if you're cutting the wheat, if some drops to the ground, leave it on the ground. When you go through and you get all of your grapes, don't go back through and get them again. You know, if you've ever picked berries, you know what, the, what he's talking about. When you, when you read, we would go pick blackberries in Washington. You would pick through and then you'd think that you got all of the blackberries off of the bush. And, and then you would look back up and it would seem like they had all of a sudden just a bunch of them and just rewrite them. Uh, because you would go, wait a second, I thought I got them all. What God is saying to the farmers is as you go through and you get the grapes, you're not going to get them all. But don't go back a second time and go back and pick them up until they've regrown. Why do that? Because those who are in need would follow behind the farmers and they would pick up what was left. Again, the difference. Those who were in need didn't just have it handed to them. You had to go out and you had to put effort in. You had to work. That was God's provision for those who were in need. And it is a something that as a society we need to look back at and say our welfare system is broken. We have disincentivized working for too many people. We need to ask ourselves how do we restore dignity? Because in this system, in God's system, there's dignity. There's dignity because I'm not just being handed my food. I'm not just being handed a paycheck. I have to go out and I have to secure it. There is a lesson that, that we as a society need to learn. And going back to Ruth. Look at God's sovereignty here. Ruth walks out. She does not know who Boaz is. She doesn't know where her family's land is. She's just walking out, going out to a field, sees a field, sees workers, knows that she has the right as a foreigner to be able to follow along behind and to pick up the leftovers. And so she's just doing what she should do to provide for her family. She has no idea of whose land she's going into. But God in his sovereignty is guiding her. Now this is one of those times where, where Ruth is being led and she doesn't even know it. 
God has provided. And it is the same for us. If Ruth had not taken the first step, if Ruth had not taken the first step to go out and to get the meal, to get the grain, the rest of the book of Ruth would not be here. And there is some really a cool and amazing stuff coming in the book of Ruth. But it wouldn't be there. It's there because Ruth is willing to get up and go out and work. She takes the first step. And as soon as she has taken the first step, God is over it. And he is guiding her and he is directing her right to the place that she needs to go. If you and I will step out in faith, we need to understand that if we step out of faith, we might make a mistake, or we might make some bad choices, and, and we might not follow it, it might not work out perfect. But know this, if you and I will make the first step, God will guide us and direct us. But he simply calls on us to take the first step. Romans 28.28 says that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love the Lord. And we know the rest of the book of Ruth. We know that because she goes out, because she goes to this one field, because she meets Boaz, we know that she becomes one of the ancestors of King David. And being one of the ancestors of King David, she also becomes one of the ancestors of Jesus himself. Because she was willing to get up and to go and to work, God continued to guide and direct and lead and work some amazing miracles. In verses 4 to 16, we see the, the love and the care that Boaz shows for Ruth. In reality, this is a picture of the care of Jesus for us. In these verses, we, we see how God looks after his people. How he looked after his people in the Old Testament, how he looked after his people in the New Testament, and how we know that he looks after us even today. Notice the greeting of Boaz to his workers. You know, that greeting really kind of demonstrates the kind of man he is. He comes up to them and, and he says, the Lord bless you, and, and they reply back. And, and as you read it, you, you almost can envision the picture that he comes up and that all of his workers are excited to see him. How many of you ever worked for a boss that when he came in, you went, oh. You know, I worked for my Uncle Wendell for a long time. And there were many times when Uncle Wendell would come up that we would just kind of go, oh, Uncle Wendell's coming. Now, it was only because he was going to harass us. You know, he was a great man, and, and we actually generally loved to see him. Boaz's workers, they see him coming. And it's as if a smile comes across their face. Didn't I tell you the kind of man Boaz is? He's the kind of guy that, that they all wanted to be around. They were glad when the boss came. And Ruth had attracted attention. People saw her. Why? Bethlehem's a small town. They recognized when she walked in. One, she's a foreigner. She's not an Israelite, she's not a Jew, she's a Moabite. So she looks a little different, but she's not from there. As soon as she walks in, everybody recognized, everybody saw her. And I am sure as she walked into the field, all of the other women, they were starting to chatter. Hey, who is that? Who is that? Oh, that's, that's, that's Naomi's daughter-in-law. Even Boaz's workers, his men, saw her, they recognized her. And then... Boaz comes up and he asks, who is, this, who is this woman? And they tell her. And Boaz demonstrates again the kind of man he is. Notice the blessing in verses 10 through 13. He says to her, my daughter, listen to me. Isn't that awesome? This is the first time he's met her. My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field. Why not? Because Boaz knows that if she goes and gleans in another field, one, she's not going to get as good as she's getting in his field. Nobody else is going to treat her. But she is also, she's a foreigner. She doesn't know anybody. She's going to get harassed, abused. And he says to her, don't go anywhere else. We will take care of you. 
And he says, he keeps on, and he says, I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. Whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink. And she says, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me? He says, I've been told by what you've done for your mother-in-law. And he says, may the Lord repay you what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel. And here's the important verses for you. Under whose wings you have come to take refuge. You know, Boaz recognized that he had a responsibility. That in his acting to take care of Ruth, that he was not doing this just because he was a Jewish man living in Bethlehem who had fields and that he was responsible. He's doing this because he saw that it was a responsibility given to him by God. He says, you have now, by coming into my field, that you have come under the wings of God, the protective wings of God. And Boaz recognizes that he is taking on a sacred responsibility. And God provides abundantly. Boaz has a responsibility to leave the edges, as we talked about from Leviticus 19, to not have his guys pick up what falls to the ground. Now, he has a responsibility. He doesn't have a responsibility to say to Ruth, hey, listen, Ruth, when you get thirsty, go to my water jug. He doesn't have to do that. God has commanded them nowhere to do that. He doesn't have to take some of the food that he has prepared, prepared and provided for his workers so that, you know, I mean, that's a smart thing. You want to take care of your workers so they'll work harder and produce more. Here, Boaz is taking care of a person who's just picking up after his workers have gone through. But he's demonstrating God's love to Ruth. And he says, here, have some of our food. He is taking care of her. And because of that love that he shows, a great hope is stirred up in Ruth and Naomi. Ruth ended the day with about a bushel of grain plus her leftover lunch. Why is that important? She's not hungry when she goes home. She gives to her mother-in-law her leftover lunch. Her mother-in-law eats the leftover lunch. So guess what happens to this bushel of grain? Now, instead of Ruth and Naomi consuming the bushel of grain that they had gathered, they can take it down to the marketplace and they can sell it or they can make something out of it. And so now, all of a sudden, not just do they have enough food for this day, but God has already provided the resources that are going to take care of them long into the future. And Naomi's hope is restored. You know, maybe here we begin to see the beginning of Pleasant, which is Naomi's name, coming back. And Naomi recognizes something else. She says to Ruth, this man is a potential, in New International, calls him a guardian redeemer. Most of us are more familiar with the term kinsman redeemer. And Ruth is told by Naomi, this man has some responsibilities. That, that if he takes those responsibilities, could change our life forever. And so what is a kinsman redeemer? Well, a kinsman redeemer is a, is a close relative who is responsible for providing for the family and for protecting their rights. Uh, the kinsman redeemer in Numbers 35, 19 says that, that he is the one who would avenge the murder or the, avenge the death of a murdered relative. In Leviticus 25, 25, it tells us that he would be the person that would buy back land that was been sold by a family member. For Israel, but keeping the land intact, keeping the land in the tribe, in the family, is, is a key concern for them. And the kinsman redeemer, if a family member would sell land, a kinsman redeemer would be the one who would go and would purchase that land and buy it back. In Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 through 10, one of the things a kinsman redeemer would do is they would bury the wife of a dead brother who had no children. One, to, to produce children 
to continue that family line, but also to take care of and to protect the widow. Any family that was sold into slavery, the kinsman redeemer would be responsible for buying that family back, but also to help the family secure justice. The job of the kinsman redeemer was to provide, to protect, to care for the family. The kinsman redeemer, and Boaz in particular, is a picture for us of Jesus Christ. Jesus has bought us out of slavery through his death on the cross. But Jesus is the one who provides and protects. And Boaz gives us a little picture, a little glimmer of what Jesus will do in the future. Isn't it amazing? The guy who does it, the guy who gives us this picture, ends up in the family line of Jesus. God has protected Ruth. Why has he protected Ruth? Because remember a few weeks ago, Ruth says to her mother-in-law, where you go, I will go. We sang it this morning. We sang a song that's based off of that saying. Where you go, I will go. I will follow you. That's all well and good. But the most important part of that is, she says to Naomi, your God will become my God. Boaz is stepping in and providing the protection that he's in the world because God has called him to it. And why did God call him to do that? Because Ruth has become a believer. She says to Naomi, your God will become my God. Well, who is Naomi's God? It is the God of Israel. It is the Father of Jesus Christ. It is the one whom you and I worship. And he has provided for Ruth far beyond what was required. God does the same for you and I. God provides for us far beyond what is required. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to worship. But Father, we thank you most of all for sending Jesus to become our Redeemer, to free us from the bonds of slavery and to sin, and to give us what we need in life. Father, I pray that if there is anyone here this morning that has not taken that step of asking Jesus to forgive them of their sins, Become part of this family. The Lord, I pray they would do it today. And Father, if there are ones here today that, that want to make this their home, Lord, I pray that, that you would give them the courage to step out today. Father, help us in everything we do. That we might be a church that lives up to these ideals that have been exemplified so perfectly by both ends. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Before we say, I want to encourage you to go to your connection card. Under I commit to, we have two challenges for you. The first is, I want to proclaim Jesus as my kinsman redeemer. You know, if you have never come to a place in your life where you have recognized that, that you're a sinner, that, that you have, have been enslaved to sin, then today is the day to get out of slavery. God has offered us, He has paid the price. For your sin and for mine. And if you've never done that before, I want to encourage you to mark that. And then in a minute we'll be seen. If you've never made that decision and you make it today, come down and talk with me. I'd like to pray with you. I'd like to just encourage you as a church. And then the second one is I have seen God provide and protect me. You know, all of us have probably seen places. As we look back, often we don't see it when it happens. It's usually when we look back and we begin to realize how things worked out that we go, that could only be the hand of God. I want to encourage you as one to mark that and just take some time as we sing to say thank you to God for those times that He's provided and protected you. If there's another decision that you need to make today, I encourage you as we sing together that you come forward as we sing. Let's stand and sing.
glad you see it. As we come to our time of offering this morning, if you're a first time guest here with us today, we want to say thank you for coming and worshiping with us. And we ask as we take our offering that you don't give this morning. That you're our guest. Now, if you would like to give to help out with the uh, to give to the disaster relief organization that the Texas Baptist Men, if you'd like to do that, you're more than welcome to. Uh, but we believe that as a church body, that it is our responsibility, those of us who are regular attenders and members here, to take care of the other ministry efforts that we do as a church. And so as we take our offering this morning, I encourage you to give. If you want to give to the, to, uh, the disaster relief, write the check out to First Baptist. Uh, but you just put on a memo line, disaster relief, and we'll make sure that we'll get that uh, to the right place. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for coming.